I'm Dr. Jim Paris. Uh, I'm a small animal surgeon at the University of Florida, and I'm going to cover the small animal surgery section of your licensing examination board review. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on three uh, three different sections. We'll, we'll have just some general uh, topics, and then we'll look more closely into the soft tissue and orthopedic conditions. To start with, suture material, uh, the absorbable suture materials. PDS or polydioxanone is a, a monofilament suture, a very similar suture to Maxon or polyglycanate, which is also a monofilament. Both of these will be present in the wound for up to around six months. Uh, Vicryl or polyglycan 910 is a, a multifilament suture. This is going to be absorbed much quicker within a few weeks. And Dexon polyglycolic acid, a multifilament absorbable suture material. And then finally, chromic gut. This is made out of the sheep or cattle small intestinal submucosa, and this is also a multifilament suture. For the, uh, specifically, Dexon has been shown to have quicker absorption time in urine, and degradation products have been shown to have potent antibacterial effects. Uh, surgical gut, Treatment with chromic salts increases the strength and resistance to digestion, uh, and depending on the concentration of the salts, this will dictate uh, how much it does so. For the non-absorbable suture materials, ethylon or dermalon uh, is nylon, this is a monofilament, and then proline or polypropylene is also a monofilament. These are probably the most common uh, non-absorbable suture materials used. We also will use silk, which is a multifilament suture material for its handling characteristics and ligating vascular structures, and occasionally stainless steel, <coughs> also a monofilament uh, suture material. Vetafil or Supermid, which is uh, polymerized capillactam, is a multifilament non-absorbable suture that uh, is, is actually been sh shown to be associated with causing fistulations and infections when used inappropriately, uh, this suture material should not be sterilized chemically. It should either be sterilized with ethylene oxide or with heat sterilization. Uh, features of proline that are unique is it is the least rhombogenic of the suture materials. It is very inert and has the best knot security of the non-metallic synthetic monofilaments. To establish an infection in a wound, you need to have a critical level of bacteria, and this is generally known to be 10 to the fifth bacteria per gram of tissue. Uh, the risk of infection does depend on not only the number of bacteria, but also the virulence of the, the individual bacteria and also the host resistance. When we classify surgical wounds, we, we do so in, in four different categories. Number one is a clean procedure, and this would be uh, such as a spay where no contaminated uh, organ is, is incised. Then we have clean contaminated, uh, for example, an enterotomy to do a, an intestinal biopsy. We have con contaminated, and this would be when we have gross spillage from uh, an organ that does have contamination, such as uh, doing a subtotal colectomy and having a uh, some of the uh, colonic content spill into the abdominal cavity. And then dirty is when we are actually incising through normal tissues to get to uh, a, an infected area, such as lancing of an abscess. Wound healing is divided into four different stages. Inflammation is the initial event that occurs, and this is between 12 and 24 hours. Uh, this is started by the blood clot and the fibrin seal. 
and then during the next two to four days, uh, debridement occurs, and this is predominantly white blood cells, and most importantly, the macrophage, uh, because this will then be the, the signal uh, cell to send out cytokines to induce uh, arboblast to, to come into the wound to help begin the process of proliferation. And proliferation is going to start around day three or four and go to up to three weeks, and uh, fibroblasts will be laying down collagen. Um, after the three-week period of time, we have a remodeling or maturation phase, and this is reorganization of the collagen, collagen fibers that will strengthen over time. The general recommendations for lavaging wounds are seven to eight pounds per square inch. Uh, this can be achieved with a, a 60 cc syringe and a, an 18 gauge needle, and to do so in a pulsatile manner. Uh, when topical uh, antiseptics are used, 0.05% to 0.1% of chlorhexidine uh, is recommended, and this will have minimal inhib inhibition of granulation tissue when used at this dilution. When povidone iodine is used, it is used at 0.5%, and povidone iodine has been shown to be inactivated by organic matter. <coughs> When considering bandages, we usually do bandage wounds with three different layers. We have a contact layer, and the first uh, this is the first layer. This is going to contact the wound, and we generally either use an adherent or a non-adherent uh, layer or dressing. The adherent dressings will be the wet-to-dry, dry-to-dry, or wet-to-wet -wet bandages, depending on how much wound fluid is, is exudating from the wound. The wet to dries would be used when we have uh, very little wound fluid and we actually need to introduce some fluid to help loosen up some of the uh, debris that needs to be debrided. And then as when we use a dry to dry bandage, basically there's a lot of wound fluid and we don't need to wet the bandage before applying it to the wound because the, the wound is exudating so much. Uh, the non-adherent dressings, we, we only use if we have a nice, healthy bed of granulation tissue and we're trying to promote epithelialization without debriding the wound whenever the bandage is changed because the other uh, adherent dressings will pull off the superficial portion of the wound. Then the intermediate layer is the second layer, and this will be providing absorption and pressure uh, relief and also support and it will also apply pressure to the wound to to help with post-operative swelling in some instances. Uh, then we have the tertiary layer and this this is also for providing support and protection and also water resistance. Uh, there are a number of different bandages and slings but to mention a few the spica splint is used for stabilizing humeral and femoral fractures, at least temporarily, uh, it's impossible to immobilize the shoulder and the hip joints completely, even with this bandage. So it's usually only used as a temporary bandage before primary fixation is undertaken. Uh, then we have the Robert Jones, and this is usually used for fractures below the elbow and below the stifle. A Velpo sling is, is used to fix the animal's uh, front leg in uh, a flex position, and this we use to treat shoulder luxations and scapular fractures, and sometimes postoperatively to help take the weight off of fixations uh, in in the scapula and, and in shoulder uh, arthrodeses and, and repairs. Then we have the shoulder, the, the Schrader Thomas splint. This is a, a traction device made with bandaging material and aluminum rods, and this is for fractures that are below the elbow and the stifle. Uh, to mention a few drains, we have passive drains. These depend on gravity and capillary action. Uh, for an example of this would be the Penrose latex drain. And then we have active drains. These are negative, negative suction drains, uh, such as the Jackson Pratt or Snyder drains. And these, these will apply a continuous or an intermittent um, uh, negative suction to to uh, wick fluid out of the wound. 
and any drain will produce between one and one and a half mils per kilo per day. Perioperative antibiotics, uh, most commonly we'll use cefazolin, a first generation cephalosporin, and most commonly we're targeting the bacteria of Staphylococcus and Escherichia coli, and periop antibiotics are usually given at induction of anesthesia or 30 minutes prior to uh, the initial skin incision is made. And then the doses of Cefazolin are repeated uh, every two hours, usually throughout the procedure until the skin is closed. And there's there's no evidence to to, pr to prove that using periop antibiotics uh, longer than 24 hours after surgery has any benefit uh, in reducing the incidence of postoperative infections. When we culture wounds, we usually it, it's recommended to culture a wound before and after debridement and lavage. Sometimes the uh, the bacteria uh, identities are going to be different after thorough debridement and lavage or the bacterial numbers. And we usually recommend aerobic and anaerobic culture and sensitivity. We'll have the best chance of recovering bacteria or growing bacteria when an actual piece of tissue is submitted. Uh, this has uh, been shown to be true, especially in the bladder when when um, performing a cystotomy that culturing the bladder mucosa will, will yield the most likely uh, growth of, of organisms over just over urine, for example. There are three different types of wound closures and then, then letting wounds heal by open healing or second intention healing. Uh, primary wound closure uh, is, for example, would be just after doing a spay procedure where we're going to close the wound primarily right after a procedure is performed. Uh, we have delayed primary. These are wounds with gross contamination or devitalized tissue that we're not comfortable with closing right away. And we're going to close these on average three to five days after the injury has taken place or a bite wound has taken place. Uh, we have secondary or third intention healing. and this, these are wounds that have chronic contamination and require a longer uh, time of debridement. Uh, this typically would be a couple weeks after wounding and we've got a nice healthy bed of granulation tissue and these are commonly closed over, over a Prendrose drain or some sort of drainage um, from the wound. <clears throat> and then finally, second intention healing is allowing a wound to heal by uh, second intention or open healing where we don't provide any closure at all. We just allow the wound contraction and wound epithelialization to occur uh, naturally. So now we'll cover some of the specific soft tissue diseases in, in detail. Uh, cleft palate is a congenital condition. And this is a, you probably can't see this too well, but this is a, a photograph of a um, of a cat with a cleft palate having primary repair of the of the actual cleft, and we've done this by incising the edges and elevating mucoperiosteal periosteal um, flaps to and sliding them towards the midline. Oronasal fistulas also occur in the palate. These are acquired conditions, and they are sometimes seen with trauma. Uh, they can be the result of surgery if we've taken out a, a section of the maxilla for a maxillary located tumor, and then sometimes with severe periodontal disease, there is a hole left uh, communicating between the oral and the nasal cavity. Salivary mucoceles, most of these will occur in the, the cranial cervical area or the intermandibular uh, region. Uh, you might be able to make out a dog's snout is being lifted here, and we see a very large accumulation of saliva right here in the uh, upper portion of the neck. When these, when the saliva accumulates in the sublingual location, as pictured here, this is called a ranula, and sometimes uh, dogs will have both the intermandibular and the sublingual uh, accumulations. The sublingual salivary gland is usually the gland that is leaking, 
uh, regardless of whether these uh, collect in the intermandibular uh, sublingual or even in a pharyngeal location. It's always the sublingual gland or almost all, in almost all cases that is leaking and it is necessary to remove the mandibular gland and the sublingual glands together. <clears throat> Following removal of these glands will we'll then drain the mucus seal by inserting a Penrose drain and allow, allowing that to drain for uh, three to five days. Different feeding tubes available. We have the nasogastric feeding tube. Uh, we have a nasoesophageal, pharyngostomy tubes, uh, where a, a hole is made just in the in the in the uh, pharyngeal region. And then we have the esophagostomy tubes, as pictured here. Uh, the hole for the esophagostomy tube is going to be a little bit further caudal than where a pharyngostomy tube would be placed and this has less incidence of obstruction of the larynx uh, than pharyngostomy tubes do. And then we have <coughs> gastrostomy tubes, a uh, picture of one here. Here's the cat with uh, what we call a low profile uh, thylastic uh, gastric feeding tube that can be in place for, for a long period of time. And then finally, jejunostomy tubes, which are indicated in cases of pancreatitis when we're trying to feed the animal and at the same time bypass the, the stomach and upper portions of the gastric, uh, gastrointestinal tract. <clears throat> okay, for our gastric surgery, most commonly we will be performing gastrotomies and uh, this will be, uh, for example, to take out a, a gastric foreign body, sometimes with uh, resectable gastric neoplasias, uh, or in doing partial gastrectomies following necrosis from a gastric dilatation volvulus. Um, we're usually going to do either a single or more commonly a two-layer inverting closure, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to make out uh, these patterns here, but they are pictured in most of the surgery textbooks um, where we're going to take bites uh, before and then coming out before the incision and then exiting before we get to the incision, going over to the other side of the incision and then doing the same. So the end result is that the tissues invert, and this can be done either in an interrupted or continuous uh, pattern. There are a couple different surgeries done in the pyloric area. One is called pyloromyotomy, and this is done through the muscular layer only. Um, if there's muscular hypertrophy that's causing a gastric outflow obstruction. We also have the YTU pyloroplasty, which is, is also done for uh, gastric outflow obstructions, uh, but these will be cases that have more of a mucosal involvement as well. And this then requires a full thickness incision. Um, so pictured here, we, we start with a Y-shaped incision and then advancing the upper portion of the Y into the lower portion of the Y, the end result is a U-shaped uh, closure pattern that functionally widens the pyloric uh, outflow area. <coughs> so I mentioned gastric dilatation volvulus. It's very important to, in, to diagnose this condition that we do, uh, we take the radiograph in right lateral recumbency because if the stomach has rotated to the opposite side in right lateral recumbency, the pylorus will be outlined by air, and we should not see that because if the dog is in right lateral recumbency, the pylorus should be close to the table and then outlined by fluid. So when we see a pylorus outlined by air or compartmentalization of the stomach, then we know we have that diagnosis. Uh, the four different gastropexy procedures that are performed um, are the tube gastrostomy, which is done less commonly, uh, the incisional, which is probably the most commonly used technique, and then the belt loop and circumcostal. And both these techniques have been shown to be a little stronger than the other techniques, but uh, as long as the incisional is done properly, it's what the majority of surgeons do. Okay, we're going to switch to small intestinal surgery for doing uh, enterotomies and resection and anastomosis. We'll be doing enterotomies uh, for intestinal biopsies or to remove a foreign body. 
uh, or multiple form bodies such as linear form bodies in cats sometimes require multiple anaerotomies. And then in some conditions where we have neoplasia that needs to be resected or we have a devitalized section of bowel uh, from either form body or trauma, then we will have to perform a resection and anastomosis. And this is usually done with a full thickness, appositional, uh, interrupted closure. Uh, some surgeons prefer um, a modified GAMBI to get better apposition of the tissue layers, but most commonly uh, we'll be using a full thickness closure. And then it's usually recommended to perform an omentopexy to help with any sealing of any, of any leaking that could occur around the anastomosis site, and especially in patients who are immunosuppressed or uh, receiving chemotherapy drugs, serosal patches by suturing the serosal layers of adjacent bowel loops over the closure site and the anastomosis site is recommended to help prevent leaking. The surgery of the colon is always a little more dangerous because you have higher bacterial uh, levels and a lot of anaerobic bacteria. Uh, the colon has a segmental blood supply and is in general a little slower to heal than the small intestine. Uh, there's high collagenase activity. Um, colonic surgery is most, most commonly done with cats with idiopathic megacolon or we're either doing a subtotal or in some cases a total colectomy. Rectal prolapse uh, can result from any condition that causes excessive straining, and this is usually we attempt to try to treat this with just manually reducing the, the prolapse section of rectum and tying a purse string uh, to hold it in, um, and then trying to correct the underlying problem that's causing straining. If we have non-viable tissue uh, that cannot be reduced safely, then we will have to amputate the section of uh, rectum that, that has prolapsed and perform a 360 degree anastomosis. If the condition is very severe, we will sometimes also do a colopexy to help prevent recurrence. So I have to do an abdominal incision and go in and pexy the colon to the abdominal wall. Two of the more important anal or perianal tumors, uh, perianal adenomas, we usually see in older intact male dogs and uh, castration will lead to regression of these tumors because they are androgen dependent. Um, surgical excision is acceptable as well, but many of them will regress with castration, which is sometimes indicated for other reasons uh, anyway. Um, also, anal sac apricot gland adenocarcinoma uh, we see in it's usually older female dogs, uh, and this, is, this tumor has been associated with hypercalcemia of malignancy. Uh, various procedures to address otitis externa and otitis media. Um, for very mild cases, sometimes a lateral ear canal ablation or a ZEP procedure will be performed. And this will improve drainage and will improve the environment in the horizontal canal. It still does require that the ears are medicated uh, by the owners and cleaned frequently. Um, ventral bolosteotomy is performed in most commonly in cats to to remove uh, polyps from the middle ear uh, or to treat otitis media that is not involving, does not have an otitis external component. This picture shows the approach to uh, the, the bulla in a cat. Um, can't see it too well, but uh, in retracting the lingual nerve, we, we then get exposure to the to the bulla and we make a hole into the cavity and debride uh, the, the contents of the bulla um, with, a, with a bone curette. Total ear canal ablation and lateral bulla osteotomy are performed to remove uh, contents uh, within the bulla and the entire ear canal and in this condition we're, we're not going to we're going to remove the whole ear canal so medication of the ear canal is no longer necessary. Uh, this would be an example here of a dog that has end-stage otitis externa and probably media, uh, which then we would recommend a total ear canal ablation and lateral velocity This procedure is done very commonly. We do see, however, uh, several complications. Uh, probably most commonly is it some degree of facial nerve damage 
whether it's just a, a temporary stretching or neuropraxia of the nerve or whether we have permanent dysfunction. A Horner syndrome is sometimes seen because there are some sympathetic nerve fibers that run through the middle ear and with aggressive curetting are sometimes damaged. Uh, hemorrhage uh, has been seen and can sometimes be significant because there are branches of the carotid artery close by. And then sometimes in a low number of the cases we'll see abscess formation uh, that is usually associated with a fistula if we um, are accidentally leave some of the epithelial tissue uh, behind. This is most commonly, this most commonly occurs right at the junction of the ear canal to the external acoustic meatus. The brachycephalic syndrome, this is going to be seen most commonly in bulldogs and other brachycephalic breeds. And there are uh, five different components. We have stenotic nares, we have the elongated soft palate, everted laryngeal saccules, which occurs as a result of negative pressure in, within the larynx, uh, and then a hypoplastic trachea. In long-standing uncorrected disease, we will then get end-stage uh, laryngeal collapse. Um, the averted laryngeal saccules are actually the first stage of laryngeal collapse, uh, but when it gets more severe and the arytenoid cartilages start collapsing toward the midline, then the prognosis becomes very poor. So we like to try to correct this uh, very early in life. Uh, tracheal collapse, another very common respiratory disease, usually seen in small breed dogs such as Yorkshire Terriers and Pomeranians. There's a classic goose honk cough. And we can see the either the intra or extra thoracic portion of the trachea or both be affected. Trachea collapse is graded between uh, from grades one to four based on the, the degree of luminal compromise. So grade one would have 25% of the lumen uh, compromised, a grade two, 50% decrease in diameter or area. Uh, a grade three would be a 75% reduction in luminal area, and then grade four would be a 100% decrease uh, where the dorsal membrane is actually touching the ventral portion of the trachea. Um, for diagnosis, uh, most commonly fluoroscopy is performed on the awake animal in addition to radiographs to um, to confirm the diagnosis and then to better grade it, uh, to determine the grades and to look at the main stem bronchi, we will perform tracheoscopy before recommending whether surgery would be indicated. Uh, we always try to exhaust medical management, but it, uh, in some cases, surgical intervention is necessary uh, when the cases are very severe. Laryngeal paralysis is a result of denervation, atrophy of the crico or retinoideus dorsalis muscle, and this is innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, it's a bilateral disease, uh, but we, the surgery is only done unilaterally because doing it bilaterally will predispose the dogs to aspiration pneumonia. Uh, surgery is a lateralization of the arytenoid, also called a tieback procedure, and Normally, we expect the arytenoids to abduct, abduct, on inspiration. So this is very important to know as you're doing a laryngeal exam and to determine whether a given dog has laryngeal paralysis. Uh, the most common or worrisome complication is aspiration pneumonia after surgery because we've permanently fixed the airway in, a, in an open position, making them more likely to take uh, in food contents into the airway. Tracheostomy should be performed between the, the third and fourth or fourth and fifth tracheal rings. The, the technique of choice is a transverse tracheotomy or tracheostomy. Um, this can also, it can also be done uh, in a vertical or a U-shaped fashion, but most surgeons will use a transverse incision between the rings rather than across them. It is recommended that the uh, the tube diameter of the tracheostomy tube should should not exceed one half uh, the diameter of the lumen of the trachea. The lateral thoracotomy or the intercostal thoracotomy is done to treat conditions such as neo, uh, lung neoplasia, uh, lung abscesses, or lung lobe torsions. 
We also can perform a pericardectomy through this approach and ligate a patent ductus arteriosus, uh, PDAs, or, and also uh, ligate and divide a persistent right aortic arch, and that's usually the, the fourth aortic arch that persists on the right side to cause that vascular ring anomaly. And then also chylothorax, uh, we will approach from, uh, <clears throat> from an intercostal approach to perform thoracic duct ligation, uh, which is successful in some of the cases. Lung lobectomies are usually done by either individually ligating the pulmonary arteries and veins as well as the, the bronchus, but we can also use uh, a special stapling device to do it uh, without ligations. And we can either remove the entire lobe of lung or just a portion of it for partial lobectomy. <coughs> Median sternotomies are performed to treat conditions such as uh, neoplasia, uh, like thymomas, uh, which can be very large and too large to take out through an intercostal approach. Uh, pericardectomy can also be performed through median sternotomy, and it, it is the preferred technique if we need to perform an exploratory thoracotomy to visualize all the different lung lobes, uh, such as with spontaneous pneumothorax, where we're not sure, uh, some, in some cases, where the lesion is. Um, access, though, to the, to the lung hyalus is difficult, so it is difficult to remove lung lobes from this approach. Uh, there's a lot of different types of hernias, and it depends, uh, number one, on the, the anatomical location. We have diaphragmatic hernias, abdominal wall hernias, uh, usually a result of trauma, and then we have inguinal and scrotal hernias. Also, perineal and uh, incisional hernias as a result of dehiscence. Um, some hernias uh, can be divided up into congenital versus acquired, uh, which are usually going to be traumatic when they're acquired. Um, uh, such as diaphragmatic hernias, sometimes they're congenital and sometimes they're a result of trauma. And then we have, they're classified as either reducible or irreducible. Uh, another term for this is incarcerated. Diaphragmatic hernias are surgical emergencies when the stomach has herniated through a, a rent in the diaphragm on the left side. Because of gas dilation, the animals become very dysmic. Um, different radiographs are done to confirm the diagnosis. If it's not obvious on plain film radiography, positive contrast studies such as a, a barium series to see intestinal loops in the chest cavity uh, or even doing parrot, uh, a peritoneogram by injecting a, a water-soluble contrast agent into the peritoneal cavity and seeing if it uh, makes its way into through a defect into the thoracic cavity. In general, the prognosis is good if they survive the first 24 hours after surgery. And diaphragmatic hernias that are congenital are, are usually peritoneopericardial hernias where the contents in the abdominal cavity are uh, herniate through into the within the pericardium. Perineal hernias, there's a higher incidence in older intact males and various organs may herniate into the, the perineal area through the pelvic diaphragm defect or weakening uh, such as the prostate uh, very commonly and sometimes the bladder. Uh, also the intestines are sometimes found in the hernia. And the hernias, herniorrhaphy is performed by suturing the internal obturator muscle that is lifted up as a flap to the external anal sphincter and either levator ani or coccygeus muscles. Port systemic shunts. In general, small breeds get extrahepatic shunts and large breeds usually get intrahepatic shunts. Uh, sometimes will manifest, uh, an animal will present with chronic urinary tract infections and this is often a result of ammonium biurate stones, a classic stone for, for shunts. And the clinical findings are, are sometimes seen are abnormal behavior, thank you, uh, seizures and head pressing, various neurological signs. In cats, we will sometimes see hypersalivation and uh, almost pathognomonic uh, cats with copper-colored eyes have been associated with portosystemic shunts. So a portosystemic shunt 
will be any communication as pictured here in light green, if you can, if you can see that close, uh, an abnormal communication between the portal venous system and the, the uh, systemic venous system. <clears throat> Splenectomies are performed for various reasons, uh, either partial or complete. Almost in most instances, there will be complete splenectomies, especially when we're dealing with a, a tumor because we don't want to leave a chance for recurrence. Um, different other conditions are splenic torsion, uh, ischemia or infarction that is sometimes seen with GDVs and the uh, torsion of the stomach that also causes torsion of the spleen. And then some of the immune-mediated diseases like hemolytic anemia is sometimes indicated to remove the spleen and also uh, trauma. Most commonly, the ligations in the splenic vessels are made at the splenic hilus. It is possible to uh, work further down in the, the main splenic artery, uh, short gastric arteries, and left, gastro, left gastroepiploic levels. Uh, but when, when doing so, you need to be careful not to disturb or uh, ligate the blood supply to the pancreas, the left lobe of the pancreas, which the splenic artery also feeds. Uh, briefly, uroliths. The radiopaque uroliths are two different types. Struvite stones, also um, called magnesium, ammonium phosphate, or triple phosphate stones. And in some instances, uh, medical treatment of these stones uh, can be successful with dissolving them. They're usually associated with infection in dogs. Calcium oxalate stones, another radiopaque stone, these are metabolic stones that will need to be removed surgically. They're not amenable to dissolution with dietary um, and medical management. And then the radiolucent stones that we more commonly see are cysteine and urates. In male dogs, stones most commonly will lodge at the base of the os penis in the urethra because it narrows before going into the bony structure. Um, if we are unable to retrohydropulse these stones back into the bladder, uh, either prior to surgery or at the time of surgery, we in some instances have to perform a urethrotomy to retrieve the stone and then relieve the obstruction. And when indicated, permanent urethrostomies are performed to help prevent uh, further obstructions. And in dogs, these are usually done in the scrotal or sometimes prescrotal area. And uh, a prepubic Urethrostomy can also be performed when the intrapelvic portion of the urethra is damaged or, or not functional. And in cats, this is either done in a, uh, urethrostomies are usually done in a perineal location, but also in a subpubic and prepubic area, again, when the intrapelvic or uh, very caudal sections of the urethra are, are damaged. <clears throat> The, the common spay neuter complications we see are, are hemorrhage, resulting either from the uterine or ovarian, ovarian arteries, uh, wound dehiscence, uh, recurrent esterus, and stump pyometra, both usually as a result of ovarian remnants being left behind, uh, because ovarian remnants are necessary to, to have a stump pyometra. And then ligation of the ureters happens in, in uh, accidentally in some cases, uh, when trying to uh, clamp off the uh, a bleeding ovarian artery because the ureters are in very close proximity to the ovarian vessels. Fistulation is sometimes seen when inappropriate suture material or uh, ligatures are used on the stumps of the ovaries and the, the uterus. For example, I mentioned the, the metafil or the supermid polymerized capillactam, when that's not properly sterilized, we'll sometimes see this is notorious for causing uh, fistula or infections to, to form that'll manifest as fistulous tracts in the, in the flank of the animal. Cryptorchidism is a hereditary condition, so we don't recommend breeding in animals that have this condition. And we need to wait those six months before we can say with certainty that a, a given testicle has not descended because it can take up to that long to do so. These testicles uh, are associated with neoplasia and the most common would be a malignant tumor uh, called a Sertoli cell tumor. 
Cryptorchid testicles can, I, can be either intra or extra abdominally located. Uh, prostatic disease in the dog, there's uh, the surgical treatment for the individual uh, diseases for BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Uh, usually the, the treatment is castration. This will cause regression of, of the prostatic parenchyma over um, a few weeks or a couple of months period of time. And then when we get prostatic abscesses or cysts, they're usually drained either with a multiple Penrose draining technique uh, or a marsupialization technique and, and, and more recently uh, just taking the greater momentum and following drainage of the prostatic abscess or cyst, uh, packing the omentum within the cavity and suturing the omentum in to allow it uh, to be able to drain, um, provide a physiologic drain uh, for the animal. <clears throat> prostatic neoplasia treatment is either none if it's too advanced or if it's not too advanced sometimes a prostatectomy is performed this does often cause urinary incontinence pyometras can be either open or closed in that the, the closed pyometras will not be draining uh, very much in the way of vaginal discharge e coli is the the most common organism and this is going to be intact females that are in diastrus are going to be the ones that are affected with this condition. Uh, cystic endometrial hyperplasia is a predisposing cause uh, to pyometra. And this often requires uh, an emergency ovarian hysterectomy. The old saying, never let the sun set on a pile. For uh, dystocias, we will sometimes perform cesarean sections are indicated when we have uterine inertia, either primary or secondary uterine inertia that's not responsive to oxytocin. Uh, or when, if we have mechanical or obstructive dystocias, and this is usually done by just an incision in the uterine body, a single incision, and then milking the, the pups down through that incision. It's also important to remove each of the placentas before closure. Closure is usually a two-layer closure inverting pattern similar to what is done in, in uh, gastric uh, gastrotomy closures. The, the different surgical procedures done for mammary gland tumors uh, are the lumpectomy where we're just doing a marginal excision around the mass. Uh, a simple mastectomy, we're just taking the, the mass and the associated affected gland, uh, mammary gland. <clears throat> a regional mastectomy would be the, the gland that's affected and, and the adjacent glands um, sharing the same lymphatic drainage usually. Uh, and then the radical mastectomy where we're taking an entire chain of glands as pictured here. Uh, where we're, we're going from cranial to caudal and uh, getting to the last portion of this tumor here. <coughs> it's always good to take either or both the axillary and the inguinal lymph nodes for tumor staging to see if the lymph nodes are involved. Uh, ovarian hysterectomy has been shown to have a sparing effect on the incidence of mammary cancer in dogs, and this is reduced to, the incidence is reduced to 0.5% when compared to a non-ovariorectomized dog if the stay is done before the first estrus. Uh, it's, it increases to 8% per, if it's before the second estrus and then 26% if it's after the second, but before the fourth. After the fourth uh, estrus cycle or greater than two and a half years of age, uh, a very hysterectomy has not been proven to have a beneficial effect in, in preventing mammary cancer. So we're going to switch to the orthopedic section now. <coughs> uh, to start with fracture classification and we always start by uh, saying whether or not it's an open or closed fracture, such as this tibial fracture. Tibial fractures are commonly open fractures, which is going to definitely affect the prognosis. Um, if it's a complete fracture, such as this, or whether there's, excuse me, just a, a fissure or a green stick type fracture where the, the fissure does not go around the circumference of the bone completely. Then we'll comment on the configuration, whether it's simple, just two fracture fragments, 
the, the, this portion and the lower portion, or whether it's comminuted and that there are many or many fracture fragments uh, at the fracture site. And then also whether it's uh, oblique or short oblique, such as this fracture, or whether it's straight across, uh, which would be termed transverse. Also, the location, whether it's in the, the diaphysis, the metaphysis, down here, or down <coughs> involving the joint uh, in the epiphysis, which is going to be above where the epiphyseal, the physeal scar uh, was located. And the bone involved, which would be, in this case, the tibia and the fibula, and then whether it was the right or left bone. We also comment on the, the degree uh, or the, the, the direction of displacement. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a craniocaudal view of the tibia and fibula, and the uh, the distal fragment is what this is named, uh, is what displacement refers to, and in this case, at least from this one film, we can tell that it's laterally displaced. <clears throat> We'd need the other view, the lateral view, to determine whether it's cranial or caudally displaced. <clears throat> the Salter-Harris classification, there's five different types. The type one is where uh, the fracture occurs. These are all the growth plate uh, fractures that affect the growth plate. And the type one, the fracture is going to go excuse me, uh, straight across the physis. And in type two, it's going to go across the physis for the majority of the fracture and then it'll uh, head up into the metaphysis to take off uh, a little metaphyseal component. Uh, Salter Harris 3 is going to start in the epiphysis, go into the physis, and then take a turn to head across the physis and leave a fragment out here. And then a type 4 is going to go through the epiphysis, across the growth plate, and then through a metaphyseal component, such as lateral condylar fractures, elbow fractures in, in puppies where they get a, a shearing injury that shears off uh, this portion of the humerus, or the lateral portion of the humeral condyle. And then finally we have the type 5. Uh, this is a crushing fracture or a compression fracture. Most commonly in dogs, this happens at the distal ulnar physis, and uh, when this occurs, it leads to premature closure, which causes radius curvus and a, a valgus deformity at the carpus. Okay, the different forces acting on fractures that we need to counteract with our repairs or stabilization techniques are bending, torsion or rotation, uh, axial compression, shear, uh, which would, would be the case if you had a, a very oblique fracture. It's going to want to slide past one, one segment is going to want to slide past the other. Um, and then distraction or tension. Uh, fracture stabilization, the, the primary fixation must neutralize all the forces that are acting at the fracture site in order to achieve healing. Uh, we, it's usually or often combined with an adjunct, some sort of adjunctive fixation, uh, such as positional screws or cerclage wires, and these are used to reconstruct or anatomically reconstruct uh, some of the smaller fragments. Um, uh, these adjunctive fixation techniques are rarely used as the, the primary fixation technique. The, the types of, of fracture healings uh, that are very important to know are that uh, we either have primary or secondary healing. And in primary healing, uh, this requires rigid stabilization. And this uh, primary healing occurs as a result of perversion remodeling or osteonal reconstruction. And these are the cutting cones where the osteoclasts lead, and following them, uh, the osteoblasts are following and laying down new bone. And with primary bone healing, we, we don't have a callus formation because the, the bones are, are very well opposed and they're rigidly stabilized, so there's no, there's no uh, need for callus formation. With secondary bone healing, the, this, this will take place when there is motion at a fracture site. Uh, or if the fracture gap is larger than a millimeter, uh, and we will get a lot of callus formation with secondary bone healing. And this, this follows the normal um, process of wound healing, starting from hematoma, 
through granulation, tissue formation, fiber cartilage, and, and then mineralized bone. When we repair articular fractures, we have to make sure we get anatomic reduction and that we get rigid uh, fixation with primary bone healing. Uh, this will help reduce the amount of callus formation and any um, any uh, steps or defects uh, in the articulating portions of the the, the cartilage. Uh, ideally, we're going to want to achieve interfragmentary compression also to help uh, make sure we get primary fixation or primary bone healing. Casting is done only for fractures that are occurring below the elbow or the stifle. Uh, anything proximal to that we cannot adequately immobilize to, to cast. Um, transverse simple fractures are going to be uh, of the radius ulna or tibia. In younger animals will be the best fractures for this repair. Uh, we don't want to, we want to ideally not use casting to treat real oblique fractures or highly comminuted fractures. Uh, that are going to want to have a lot of shearing and will not be able to resist the compressive forces applied. Intramedullary pins are, are commonly used in fracture repair. And it's very important to, to remember that a single ion pin will not provide rotational stability. So to, uh, to help this, we'll do what's called stack pinning. And this is um, where multiple ion pins are used, and that way we do get a rotational stability as well as the bending stability that is provided by the pins. Um, important to know that you cannot pin the radius without the pin going through into the carpal joint and injuring the articular cartilage. So we don't recommend pinning of the radius. Also, when we're dealing with tibial fractures, it is very important that the pin be driven from in normal grade fashion um, rather than retrograding the pin from the fracture site up proximally into uh, the proximal segment because when we drive it a uh, retrograde fashion because of the location of the cruciate ligaments and menisci, they are commonly injured when we retrograde pins. So it's important to normal grade tibial um, IM pins. The Various types of external skeletal fixators uh, are the type 1. Uh, type 1 is going to be comprised of half pins. These are pins going from a connecting bar into the cortical bone, but the, and they penetrate the, both the near and far cortex of the bone, but they do not exit uh, out the other side of the leg. Uh, so there'll be half pins in one connecting bar. A uh, type 2 will be full pins, so the pin's going to go through the skin, through the bone, and out the skin on the other side. And then we'll have a connecting bar on either side of the leg. So there'll be two connecting bars. <coughs> a type 3 will be a combination of these two types. So we'll have a type 2 fixator that in the craniocaudal plane will have, for example, a type 1 fixator coming in at a 90 degree angle. Um, and these can be tied in together uh, so they're all interconnected. And these would have three connecting bars, one cranially, one medially, and one laterally. Um, big advantage of external skeletal fixation is that it doesn't disturb the blood supply. So this technique is very good for highly comminuted uh, open fractures that we don't want to risk uh, contaminating avascular segments of bone and resulting in what are called uh, a bone sequestrum. Uh, osteomyelitis that occurs, infection, is most commonly going to be Staphylococcus intermedius. And uh, as I said, a bone sequestrum uh, is an avascular infected piece of bone. And this can also lead to fistula formation. <coughs> the vascular reactive bone that surrounds the sequestrum that's trying to wall off the infection is termed the involucrum. Okay, bone plates are used in three different ways. They, they can be used to as neutralization plates, and this is just to maintain the alignment of the reconstructed fragments. They can be used to compress fractures that are transverse and completely reconstructed. Uh, this is done with a dynamic compression plate or a DC, DCP plate, uh, and 
the degree of compression per screw uh, that is compressed is going to be one millimeter. Also, uh, plates can be used to buttress if we have a big bony defect, uh, such as one after a highly comminuted fracture, uh, we'll use a plate in buttress fashion, so the screws will only be engaging the proximal and distal, distal portions of the bone that are still intact. Uh, the size of the, the bone plate refers to the screw size, and a screw size such as a 3.5 millimeter screw, that refers to the diameter of the threads of the screw. So it all comes back to the, uh, when, when plates are made for their size, it, it refers to the threads, the thread diameter of the screws that are to be used with that plate. Two different functions of screws, and that, those are to be either positional, where the threads are going to engage both the near and the far cortex, uh, or uh, screws can be used as lag screws. And with lag screws, the threads are only going to engage the far cortex because the, <clears throat> and this can be achieved by either using a partially threaded screw that doesn't have threads on the, the first half of it, so they won't engage the near cortex when tightened down. <coughs> Or it can, we can use a fully threaded screw, but we'll have to drill the, the proximal or the near hole bigger, so at the same diameter of the screw thread, so they don't engage. And the result, when we tighten the screw down, is that the, the fracture, uh, a fracture can be compressed by the threads engaging the far cortex, and it being uh, sandwiched between the head of the screw and the threads engaging the far cortex will, will apply compression to across a fracture line. Uh, femoral fractures, the, the common techniques that we use to, to repair them are bone plates, uh, the interlocking nail more recently, as I mentioned, stacked IM pinning, uh, and also external fixtures. And they can be used to, fixtures can be used to augment uh, single IM pins as well to help with rotational stability. In very young dogs, we can get very ex we can get excessive callus formation when we have distal femoral fractures and <clears throat> so especially when we get secondary bone healing and a lot of callus, uh, sometimes we can get what's called quadriceps contracture or tie down. And if uh, aggressive physical therapy is not performed in the early stages of, of fracture repair in these dogs, they can end up with uh, permanent extension um, of the, the quadriceps muscles and a non-functional limb. Uh, bone grafts pr provide basically three different uh, processes of osteoconduction, where bone grafts act as a scaffold for ingrowth of new vessels and, and new bone formation. Osteoinduction refers to uh, the inducing of, of new bone formation, such as with bone morphogenetic proteins, and uh, these proteins uh, stimulate uh, the production of bone. Osteogenesis basically refers to the cells, such as in a, a, um, a an autograft, where a, a graft is taken from uh, one location in a patient and placed into the other. Some of the cells will survive and those cells will provide an osteogenic effect because they'll still have the capacity to produce bone. Uh, so that would be an autograft. An allograft is a graft where we're taking um, either cortical or cancellous graft, uh, bone graft from another, from one dog to another dog, and then a xenograft, which we don't use uh, very commonly in veterinary medicine, would be taking uh, that uh, bone graft from another species. <coughs> Um, cancellous bone grafts are usually harvested from the proximal humerus. Uh, also, the proximal tibia and the proximal femur are acceptable locations to, to get uh, cancellous bone. Okay, hip dysplasia, there would be a lot to cover, but in general, uh, you need to know that it's, it's associated with large breed dogs. Most commonly, at least those of the dogs are going to have clinical problems. Um, it's important to know the Ortolani sign and how to do that, uh, and that this a positive Ortolani sign will indicate that the hip is, uh, that you can subluxate a hip significantly. You only get an Ortolani sign positive if the, the acetabulum is still 
uh, still has a, a prominent dorsal acetabular rim, so the sensation after subluxing the, the femoral head can be sensed as the, the head is reduced. So this is a process where uh, to perform the Ortolani test, the dogs are in lateral recumbency. We will adduct, adduct the limb toward the midline and then push it in a dorsolateral direction. We'll then adduct the limb upward, and as we do it upward, if it has been successfully subluxated when it was adducted, then as we abduct it, it should pop back in. <clears throat> The two different uh, presentations for hip dysplasia are there's, we see some dogs between 6 and 12 months of age that come in with a very acute signs that occurs from the tearing and stretching of the joint capsule and, and round ligament and also some of the, the initial fracturing that's occurring in the dorsal acetabular rim. Uh, then the, the dogs that present with chronic uh, Chronic pain or later in life, this is usually re the result of uh, degenerative joint disease or the secondary arthritic changes that have occurred over time. Treatment, again, we always try to make sure that medical management has been exhausted before we consider surgery uh, because many animals can be managed medically uh, or with some weight loss, excuse me, some weight loss and um, some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, some of the new Newer uh, chondro protecting, um, protecting drugs are also commonly used. And if, if the signs don't resolve, then we'll sometimes resort to surgery. Uh, the surgical procedures are the TPO, or the triple pelvic osteotomy, the FHO, or the femoral head neck ostectomy, and the total hip replacement, or THR. Uh, the TPO is a procedure where three cuts are made, triple, triple pelvic osteotomy, three cuts are made, one in the ilium, uh, one in the ischium, and one in the pubis. And a special plate, bone plate, is applied that causes rotation of the acetabulum over the femoral head to improve coverage. <clears throat> this procedure is only indicated, however, if there is no degenerative joint disease or at least very, very minimal degenerative joint disease present. And this depends. Some surgeons will uh, will be more picky about this than others. Uh, the femoral head neck ostectomy and the total hip are both salvage procedures in dogs that have very advanced arthritis that have decompensated and are no longer responsive to medical management. And whether or not we do an FHO or total hip, usually depends on the size of the dog. If they're less than 60 pounds, many dogs uh, will do very well with an FHO. Um, those greater than 60 pounds, it's generally recommended to perform a total hip replacement. <coughs> okay, osteochondrosis, or OCD, commonly known, is a failure of endochondral ossification. And, uh, Actually, I should correct myself, osteochondrosis we call OC, and it shouldn't be confused with OCD, uh, which is osteochondritis desiccans. The difference being you can have an osteochondrosis lesion where cartilage is not properly mineralized, but it hasn't yet uh, developed into a flap of cartilage, uh, as we see when it uh, is termed osteochondritis desiccans. Um, this is usually the, the large and giant breeds uh, that are affected and is probably the result of, uh, in addition to genetic uh, factors, um, can be worsened by overnutrition and possibly excessive dietary calcium. Uh, the common locations for OCD uh, are the shoulder would be as pictured here in the, you can just make out a defect here in the caudal aspect of the humeral head. Um, in the elbow, we see it most, most commonly in the distal medial humeral condyle. And then in the stifle, it's most common in the lateral femoral condyle. And then in the tarsus, on the, the, medial, the medial trochlear ridge of the talus. <clears throat> okay, another real common uh, orthopedic condition that uh, one must uh, remember is panosteitis. 
And panosteitis, it happens uh, usually in dogs less than two years of age. Uh, it causes a shifting lameness, and the radiographs have a very characteristic appearance, what is what have been called fluffy intramedullary uh, opacities, as seen here in the, in the ulna, and they tend to be centered around the nutrient foramen. On physical exam, we'll find pain as we palpate the long bones and put pressure on the long bones. Um, and it is a self-limiting disease that if we usually with just with time and supportive care or pain relief with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, these dogs will resolve these lamenesses uh, on their own. Uh, by far and away, the most common breed is the German Shepherd. Okay, elbow dysplasia. Again, young, large breed dogs. Uh, this is often a bilateral condition, and uh, there's three different uh, diseases that have been lumped into this one term of elbow dysplasia, and they are the fragmented medial coronoid process and osteochondrosis of the medial humeral condyle, <coughs> and then finally, ununited ancineal process. Uh, for a dog to be diagnosed with ununited ancineal process, which again, the German Shepherd is overrepresented, they need to be older than 20 weeks of age because there is a, a normal uh, radiolucent line that represents a growth plate in this area, and if they're younger than 20 weeks, we wouldn't expect that to be closed anyway. If they're, if they're greater than 20 weeks, or possibly 24 weeks in German Shepherds, and they still see this radiolucent line at the, the base of the ancineal process, then, then we make the diagnosis uh, that the ancineal process is ununited. Uh, leg calf Perth's disease, also known as avascular necrosis of the femoral head, most commonly is going to occur in young or uh, toy and small breed dogs, such as a, a mini miniature pincher uh, and toy poodles. Um, with this disease, we get resorption uh, and then necrosis of bone, and then this leads to collapse of the femoral head and then degenerative joint disease. It is usually a, a unilateral condition and most commonly is treated by femoral head and neck ostectomy. And these being very small dogs will do extremely well with this surgery. Uh, conservative management has been reported, but uh, more often than not, we'll be taking these, these patients to surgery. Okay, patellaluxation is most common in smaller breed dogs. When we do see it in the large breed dogs, it is most commonly going to be a medial patelloluxation. Um, having said that, though, uh, when we see lateral patelloluxation, that is going to occur more commonly in large breed dogs than in small breed dogs. But again, both small and large breed dogs are usually going to be medial luxations. Uh, there's four different grades. Uh, grade one would be uh, a patella that can be manually luxated but is not spontaneously luxating, therefore not causing a clinical lameness. And then grade two, we have a spontaneously luxating patella that is causing an intermittent lameness, but it is in, in the trochlear groove most of the time. Uh, grade three would be a patella that's uh, usually Actually, this is this is a typo. It is usually, I'm sorry, that's correct. It's usually in the luxated position, but we can reduce it. Uh, a grade four then would be a patella that we cannot reduce. So again, grade three, that's correct. That the patella would be, for the most part, is riding outside of the trochlear groove, but we can put it back into the groove at least temporarily. It just tends to want to pop back out. Uh, patella luxation uh, treatment, surgery is usually recommended for grade two and higher. Uh, and a variety of different procedures um, are a combination of the, of, of the following procedures is usually done. With the wedge recession trochleoplasty to deepen the trochlear groove. Uh, in, and then a tibial tuberosity transposition where uh, an osteotomy is made in the tibial tuberosity and tuberosity is um, is pushed either medially or laterally. Laterally, if it's a medial patella luxation, and then fixed with a, a small K wire in place uh, to move the whole quadriceps 
uh, apparatus alignment um, further lateral with medial patellar luxations and, and the opposite for lateral. In some instances, anti-rotational sutures, such as those used to repair cruciate ligaments, <coughs> are employed, and uh, especially if there is a concurrent cranial cruciate ligament rupture, which is sometimes the case with patellar luxation. And then uh, another important part of the procedure to correct patellar luxation is to perform imbrication or overlapping, overlapping or tightening of the joint capsule uh, the redundant portion of the joint capsule um, that occurs over time from the joint capsule being stretched. Um, for example, for a medial patellar luxation, the lateral portion of the joint capsule is going to be stretched because everything has been pulled medially for a long period of time. So we'll have to correct that redundancy to help pull the patella back toward the lateral side when to, to correct the, the luxation. Cranial cruciate ligament rupture, approximately 50% of dogs with cruciate ruptures will also have a concurrent tear in the caudal horn of the medial meniscus. So it's very important to assess this at surgery and to, to treat it by excising the, the torn portion of meniscus. Uh, the diagnosis of cranial cruciate ligament rupture is made uh, with a positive cranial drawer test or a tibial, positive tibial compression test. Uh, there's a lot of different treatments for fixing cruciate uh, ligament ruptures. Most commonly is the extracapsular repair. These are sutures going behind the, the lateral fabella um, and then drilled through a hole in the proximal tibia, tuber tibial tuberosity. These are heavy monofilament sutures such as 80-pound uh, test fishing line or a fishing leader to help mimic the action of the cruciate ligament. Um, also, intracapsular techniques such as using a fascial autograft or a patellar ligament graft have also been used, although less commonly now. Uh, a new uh, procedure called the tibial plateau leveling osteotomy is done uh, as well. This is a very, this and the extracapsular are probably the two most common procedures that are done today. <laughs> the TPLO is recommended for very large dogs um, and does entail making an osteotomy in the proximal tibia and reorienting or uh, revising the, the actual slope of the tibial plateau to prevent the, the, the cranial thrusting of the tibia that's occurring when the, with the ligament rupture. Uh, in the past, fibular head transpositions have also been done, but they're not as commonly used today. And then we have coxipremal luxation or luxation of the, the hip joint. Uh, greater than 90% of the time, these are going to luxate in the craniodorsal direction. About 50% of the time, uh, a closed reduction will lead to a successful um, repair and uh, resolution of the problem. And sometimes an emer sling is used to help keep the limb in a flexed and keep the hip in a slightly internally rotated position. And then if open reduction fails, then, or if closed reduction fails, we have to resort to some sort of open reduction technique or reconstructing the joint capsule <clears throat> using a, a toggle pin technique. Uh, sometimes a, a TPO can be used to rotate the acetabulum fur further over and other techniques to help uh, resolve uh, the luxation. So that's all I have. Uh, thanks for your time and... Um, We'll answer questions.